Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, I'm so excited to bring you. Uh, usually I know the people that I interview and I just saw your story and your face on Facebook. And I was like, I have to talk to this man. We have Ryan Silva here, who, um, how old are you, by the way, if I can ask? 28. I'm 28. 28. Well, I'm 52. So if I ask you, I got to tell you too. So I just want to say, I read your story and I was like, so 28, I knew you were young. That is pretty young. Um, and he posted to other filmmakers, uh, don't give up. I got my film made for $5,000 uh, and it's up on Amazon right now. Um, and I had the pleasure of watching his film last night. It is so good. I wasn't thinking about the cost ever, like all the technical points were hit, all the creative um, yeah, it's it's such a great and it was about something and <laughs> the dialogue was good. It's like something that we would all aspire to as filmmakers on any budget. So it's quite an accomplishment. Congratulations, Ryan. Thank um, you, Daniel. I'm glad you watched it. And yeah, <laughs> the, the 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 micro budget didn't take you out of the story. That that was the you know the only real goal we had at, at that budget. And so that's good. Just tell the story, you know. Yeah. Oh my God, I have so many questions that I'm sure everyone has. I just want to let everyone know you will have time to ask Ryan questions at the end. Um, but before we get into the story of how you made this film, which is like going to be an amazing story in, in and of itself, I know your lead character came from Austin, moved to LA uh, to pursue a, a career as a rapper. But what is that your, or do you have, what is your LA story? So it's so it's all intertwined. It's, it is hard to kind of tell the story uh, without telling how it was made, because I think the only reason it was made was all of these things falling into place and these resources at the disposal. So I got to L.A. and I came to, you know, pursue music and I move into this apartment building and everyone I'm meeting seems to be, you know, an aspiring actor or you know, my apartment manager is an actor, my neighbor's an actress, my girlfriend was, you know, pursuing acting, you know, I take a walk around the block, and the neighbor is an editor, and I'm like, you know, I've always been a fan of film, but I, I was, I was really intimidated by the idea of writing a screenplay, and, you know, just running all these people, and they talk about LA being this place where you have all these creatives, and I guess I was like, this, this is the place to do it, I have these resources at my disposal, if I could put them all together, maybe we could actually, you know, make something. I, I think I was naive, but it all worked out. Uh, you know, all the, in my apartment manager is the actor, you know, oh my, my neighbor God. is the neighbor, you know, everyone basically plays themselves. We shot it in our apartment. And so when you talk about how to make a movie for 5,000, it's just been super resourceful. I think that's the only thing I can say that I was good at was being resourceful and using this. And when I was writing the script thinking, all right, well, I know we're going to have this apartment building. I know we can walk outside. You know, I know I have my barber. Maybe my barber will let me use his spot. And he did. Oh, and, I love uh, that scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was so cinematic. That is incredible. My and real barber. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is incredible. Um, wow. Okay, I'm shocked about the part that, so that's your real girlfriend, your girlfriend in the movie. Yes. And, you know, apartment manager and uh, like, you know, the stories I did, I did, I don't know if sensationalize is the right word because it's not a big sensational movie. No, it's not no. like there's, you know, any action scenes or anything. I did, you know, it's, it's not based on a true story in the sense that everything happened. And, you know, me and my apartment manager have a great relationship and, you know, uh, he never, you know, he, he, he never did some of the things that happened in the movie or whatever, but to, to make it a story, to make it a character, I wrote a part for him, you know, and I wrote a part for my neighbor. And so, yeah, it's, it's a little confusing, but I don't feel like it's a documentary or, you know, uh, even based on a true story in that sense, because they're all playing characters, even if they are. Yeah. So it's, based, on it's based on what you know to an extent, but it's based on what you have. By the way, your girlfriend is stunning. Like she just oh. lights up the film. Like, I mean, you you both do, but like, I was like, wow, who's this new actress? So, <laughs> so that's yeah, that's what she came to do. And, and it was tough being her boyfriend and her going out on these auditions and knowing that she had this talent. But as a musician, anytime I have an idea, I can just, you know, record it and make it but seeing actors 
have to be approved by a casting director, have to get submitted by their manager, and then the producer has to pick you. It was it's so hard to like not from from afar. I I, I sympathize with not being able to like you know practice your craft without mm -hmm. and you can do acting classes of course but actually be like perfecting your craft without approval from all these you know different leads and so anyway i i wanted to like hey well you, if i make a movie you can be in it and and um yeah i i had no intentions to ever act when we first started filming it we had a different actor there for me oh. um and i preferred it that way but then once i realized oh this is going to be something where it's like hey the barber shop is available Saturday at 10 a.m. And I know it's Friday. Are you going to be able to make it? Also, it's in four months is when they're available and we don't have any money. You know, it just didn't feel right to kind of expect or ask anybody to be there. And so it was like, all right, we're going to have to use people who are basically all live in the same building. <laughs> Wait, so you've never even taken an acting class? No, and I I, I won't act again. I, I did not. <laughs> I preferred being behind the camera in the few scenes I got to be able to. So if I get to do a movie again, I would love to, you know, actually direct um, every scene. Well, you also did a great job directing. We'll we'll talk about that as well. But wow, I'm shocked that you've never taken an acting class. You're you're lovely on camera as well, and you're very natural. Um, and you. I see a lot of movies, and I've worked on a lot of big movies. So I'm so uh, I'm so excited to by your story. It's so inspiring. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, I think Frank, the guy who plays Frank, Freddie, um, you know, I, watching him and his process, um, I felt like my job as an actor was just you know, kind of listening and, and, and <laughs> soaking it up. He, most of the job, really. Yeah. <laughs> he, he did most of the job, but yeah, I, I, I was really moved by his performance. And, uh, you know, if, if anybody's going to watch the movie and look for acting, I, I would point to, to him and, and uh, you know, Maya, the actress, you know, Wonderful. Oh, I didn't, you know what, when we opened this, I didn't set it up properly. For those who don't know, the name of the movie is called Let Me Be Frank. Um, and it is available on Amazon Prime. But in the, we found out, I tried to buy it on Amazon or rent it on Amazon yesterday and it blocked me. You need a U.S. address. So uh, Canadians can watch it on Vimeo On Demand or buy it on Vimeo On Demand. It's a uh, it's great. <laughs> it's, uh, and we'll talk about that. But um, it's got this very, it's got your vibe. It's got this very chill vibe. It's very, there's really funny parts to it. Like I can see why you called it a comedy, even though it felt more drama in many places, but that's, that's cool. Like it's got this vibe and it deals with like a really serious, uh, you know, a really important issue of bridging the gap between races. And it does so in such a subtle, charming and easy way it's it's uh there, there's so much there's so many great reasons to see this film and um and when you find out the budget it just makes you go what <laughs> so yes so um on a technical level obviously you had a tiny crew how tiny was your crew by the way so it, it changed throughout when we started like i said i was behind the camera the first the first we did what I was calling test shoots. And then I was told that those don't exist. That's not a real terminology. You start production one day and then you end. But the test shoots were really valuable for us because, you know, my boss at the time let me borrow his uh, Black Magic production cinema camera as one of the bigger, clunkier original ones. Oh. And so I was doing it. I'd never DP'd. I read a couple books, you know, on YouTube videos about <laughs> framing and stuff. And so that's how we started. And then we were like, okay, we'd like it to be a little better. And so, you know, to talk about the budget that went towards, you know, uh, buying a, uh, a better microphone mm -hmm. and some labs. And I can give the names of those uh, if you want. And then uh, we upgraded to the black magic pocket cinema camera. And so for the second test shoot, you know, then I moved in as the actor because I realized it wasn't going to be a real production and we had these, this better equipment. And then as we were getting, ready once we said like, okay this can work we're getting ready to really start production uh ran into a couple of film students from a, a local college and uh they were saying hey we're we got the summer off we'd love to get credits uh, i know you, you know you don't have anything to offer but credits you know and copy and lunch but that would be useful for us if we try to get jobs and i said if if you want to i mean we'd love to have you and so then we went from a crew of three because it was just someone holding the boom me holding the camera and then someone else you know doing the lighting and it was just the producers 
at the time. So then our crew for that that next two weekends or so was, you know, about a crew of, of six to ten, which still, <laughs> you know, I guess isn't much, but it, it felt huge to us. They were like, you know, people could actually hold the light if we needed to. And and um, so and then they had to uh, ultimately go back to school or travel during the thing. So we had two weekends with what we call a full crew. And then it kind of went back to uh, uh, three or four before or just the DP and the rest of us were holding things. So uh, it fluctuated, but the suit, you know, I don't think it would be possible without the, those film students coming and really uh, es escalating how quickly we were able, because we, we knocked out two weekends in a row, like, six days of production and did all the interiors and then we're like, okay we have a movie we kind of have to finish this now and then some later scenes like the barber shop or the restaurant came three or four months after when we could finally book that location and so we just had to stay ready um I oh, forgot what the question was now, oh how big was the crew okay there you go <laughs> and oh and like really how much did you know before making the movie because you produced directed and wrote we'll talk about the script too but like how much did you know about the process I so I all I wanted to do was write my idea was I have all these friends who want to make movies I'll write them something and then <laughs> they can do it you know I had a director friend as well so the director didn't you know he he, he wasn't available to do it. Um, he had just tried kind of doing a low budget thing and it exhausted him. And I totally get it now. But at the time I was like, oh, come on, you know, <laughs> what's, what's another one? Uh, and so I, I had no intentions. And then the editor, who was my neighbor, uh, ended up becoming a producer. He, no, nobody was really, I wanted to sell the script or something, but nobody was really you know, interested in that way. It's really contained in a lot of dialogue, not very really high concept. So I get it. Um, but I went over to his place and said, I read, I finally read your screenplay about three or four months after I gave it to him, come over. I thought I was going to get every, like everyone else, give me all these notes on, you know, how I need to be better. But he said, I really like this and you need to make this. And I was like, what do you mean make it? Like, I don't, <laughs> I, I, I want it to be good. So I don't want to make it. He's like, no, you, you should make it. You can make it. I'll edit it for you for free um, if you make it. And then he gave me this Robert Rodriguez book, Rebel Without a Crew. Mm -hmm. And then I read it and then I finally thought, okay, maybe I can make this. Just not being okay with not knowing it and being okay with it not being as good as maybe I imagined. And so it was that book. And then like I said, a bunch of YouTube videos about kind of you know framing and directing and, and lighting and then again being like the only thing I was an expert of on set was the story and I relied heavily on the DP who went to film school to really know you know about lighting and 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 help me on my ideas of framing and so the DP and as well as this editor producer and uh Fr Freddie who plays Frank who had acted in you know things for the last 20 years or so I relied on them heavily to, uh, wow. to help me with the technical stuff. Well, I always do tell my students that the most important, you, you, you can, everything can fall apart in a movie, though nothing did in yours, but everything else can fall apart. If you have performances and you have a story, you have a movie and you had both. So even if you didn't have all those other things, I think it would still be watchable. It was a really good story. Um, very, like you said, it's like not high concept at all, but, um, but, you know, still a completely, I was, I watched the whole thing front to, you know, top to bottom in one, you know, which we don't say about a lot of things a lot of the time. Um, so how many screenplays had you written? Was this your first feature? This, yeah, this is the first time where I, I like, Hey, I'm going to sit down I'm gonna do it. And I had a goal one page per day and I did the math. I was like, in about three months, I, I can do it. And then six months later, you know, I finally finished it. I was like half a page a day. OK, I guess you know, it's nothing to celebrate, but I got it done. And then, you know, we made some edits as we started. You know, I showed it to the actors, you know, say, hey, remember I told you I was going to write your movie. Check it out. You know, is this something you want to do? Um, and, you know, made a few uh, edits. And then since then, you know, I've written a few more. Nothing that is in production or, you know just things I, I hope I can get made one day. Um, but that was my first one. And I feel, you know, I feel like it was 
helpful. Like I said, the only thing I'm really passionate about is writing. And I feel like making this, even if it was a completely different challenge, you know, I, I feel like writing is super lonely. You're by mm -hmm. yourself and you have to, you know, commit yourself. And then directing was the exact opposite. It was so overwhelming because you haven't, you know, even a small crew, it was like 12 people maybe one day that were looking at me on what to do. And I'm like, I just want to be alone. That's what I'm comfortable <laughs> with, you know, talking to no one. Um, but I, I do think that helped me with being able to write on some of my future things, have an idea of what works and, you know, yeah. how you can get away with showing things rather than telling them. Uh, yes, I loved um, some of your directing, like your directing was really simple and clear. Uh, and also because it had to be because of the budget in terms of like, there was nothing super fancy, there was nothing extraneous. But those little moments where you did specific shots, like through the mirror, or like there's a little, mm -hmm. looked like a little handheld moment. And I was like, oh, these are so they're sumptuous. They jumped out. They were, um, they were helping the scene because they, they, I don't know, they just seemed to come from a place of story. So I really appreciated that in your directing. So thank you. Yeah. Happy, happy accidents. Just being there, stumbling upon things and, you know, and yeah, that means your intuition is great as a director because you could feel, but you never wanted, do you want to direct again? I, I had, there's one more idea. I don't think I can make it for 5,000, but this one, you know, even if it's enjoyable and I'm proud of it, you know, you could, you could say it's a little cliche with the, you know, you know, aspiring artists in LA. And, you know, I, I did want to shout out myself, dig a little deeper into my, my roots in, in Texas. And so I'd like to, you know, maybe there's one I could, I could um, write and direct closer to where I'm from and kind of dig into some of my upbringing. So maybe that one, Alan, and we'll see how that goes. I so hear you on that. Um, I have the, I'm the same in terms of, and I think all the writers hear you on that on wanting to be alone on yeah. page <laughs> as well. But yeah, there's only certain ones I direct. Um, so writing to budget, when you wrote the script, it sounds like you had, did you think about everything you had access to and wrote around that? Or did you write the script first and then? <laughs> no, I was exactly right. It was, it was backwards in the sense that, all right, I know my actors, I know my locations. What story can I make from this? And so I don't know if I'd recommend that into making the best story. But in this case, I knew that if I do it that way, it, it might be something that can actually get made uh, and, and be filmable. So it, it, it worked in at least completing a film. And it's a, it's a very simple and clear and good story. And so how did you choose that story? Um, yeah, I think... One of the things, you know, I'm really inspired by, I was from, I didn't, you know, grow up in Austin, but I went to college in Austin. And that's why I discovered like Richard Linklater and some of his went dialogue heavy, you know, just really like human relationship, human interaction based movies. And so I, I wanted to, to just as a screenwriter, the way that when I, I didn't want to be in it, the way I wanted to kind of leave my fingerprints on it is, you know, talk about some things that you know may be relevant to me that I, I don't know how to express in other ways like you know I like writing songs but some there's some topics you know like your relationship with the you know older apartment manager that's just you know it's hard to make a song out of that that's you know you, you can dance to and so I just found that I saw this as a way to explore like other topics I may be interested in like you know generational differences uh you know advances in technology and how that may you know affect people differently and whether they're bringing us together or far apart that sort of thing and so um yeah I, Nina Simone has this quote about you know artists should reflect the times or something and so I I wanted to try to do a story if it was going to be simple and heavy on conversation I wanted it to be meaningful conversation at least topics I'm interested in oh great um did you have to uh, you rewrote for the actors voices and everything but did you have to rewrite anything along the way for budget or the unexpected um I don't I don't think so. I think a lot, uh, a few of the rewrites ended up once we realized we're making this, okay, well, you know, this, this montage actually really needs this. Now there were times where we had our rough cut. And since we all were in the same building and neighborhood, 
it, was, it wasn't like, oh, man, I wish we had wrote or made this scene. It was like, hey, what are y'all doing next week? You know, let's add a scene where you can tell that the relationship is is maybe, you know, the two leads are going in different directions because right now that conflict isn't there. And so I think it was it was really writing. Um, if anything, it was more scenes into it than I had originally. The ending, um, which, you know, spoiler alert, I guess. I, mean, I don't have to say the whole thing, but <laughs> the end scene wasn't in the original script. Oh. Uh, and I realized, oh, actually, I think the last thing we need to see is is Frank. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't think that at first. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was a nice moment. I have to say that was a nice moment. Um, so did it really, really cost 5000 Did you end up spending any more in post? Um, well, so the post, uh, again, the editor, the neighbor who had agreed to do it for free before Adam, maybe he didn't think we were actually going to make it, you know, so he had to... Uh, you know, he had to honor that, but yeah, so we got to edit it um, for free. And then, um, you know, we had sound and uh, coloring as well from people who were, like I said, with the film students who are just excited to get credits and copy. And so, but, you know, you're interviewing me, but this is completely only possible by people wanting to like make films and, and sacrificing time and effort um, uh, for, and reasons that like aren't monetary and mm -hmm. of course we want to pay anybody but it started to get to a point especially in post where it's like, oh you know we'd love to pay you but then the other 20 people who worked on this so far it wouldn't really be fair to them because they you know decided to pay i mean to work on it um for free and so the, the hope was if we were able to make money off this we, we did film festivals that that's where some of the money went to is, is submitting to film festivals. But we oh, you included that. your promo budget. Most people don't. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we maybe even looking back made a mistake of just submitting to the, the big one South by Sundance, you know, Tribeca. Maybe there are a few others we could have done, but at, at one point we we're just ready to get the movie out. And so we were hoping if the money, you know, the movie sold and we could go back and pay everybody. But as of now, you know, we never expected to really make money from this. And that's why we didn't put in a bigger budget to begin with. Um, we just wanted to put a story out there and hopefully everyone could like get paid on their next project because of this. Oh, yes, including you. I mean, it's so hard to um, monetize where these things go. But I have one of my friends, one of my bosses was Salima Keel really early in my career. And I don't know if you're familiar with his career. I mean, he's like a superstar in Hollywood now, but he um, is married to Mara Braca Keel, another incredible person in her own right as a career screenwriter showrunner but Salim uh, started out doing what you did he made an independent film I think he actually shot on film because it was back in the day right <laughs> and where we when we shot on film um, and somebody saw it Felicia Henderson saw it the creator of Soul Food the series and hired him to be in the writing room that's where I met him because I worked on set and then by the end of the, the, you know, five seasons of Soul Food, he was the showrunner. And then he just went on and on and on as a direct and he directed like a gazillion episodes, too. So it's, it was just and his talent back then was like so evident. <laughs> it, was, it was just anyway, it was the same. So you never know where these things will lead. So it's hard to quantify it at this moment. Did you actually make any cash profit, though? Uh, not, not yet. So, you know, it got on Amazon and, you know, we can get into that once we didn't get into the festivals, the, the idea was, all right, how do we just get this where it can be viewable by as many people as possible? And we found this distribution service called film hub. And mm -hmm. so the deal they do is there's no upfront costs. They take 20% of, uh, of what you make and they pitch it to a bunch of channels, but most notably Amazon prime, to be uh, Plex, you know, and some smaller ones. Um, but the Amazon Prime deal, whether you go through them or just directly through Amazon Prime is five cents per hour stream. So, <laughs> so you're not looking, you know, you're gonna have to get streamed a lot to make, uh, you know, for those five cents to add up, you know. Um, but I hear Tubi, uh, you get more money on Tubi because they have commercials. Mm -hmm. But we haven't got selected to Tubi yet. So, yeah, as of now, uh, you know, we're, we're still deep in the red with the uh, five cents. You know, <laughs> and what about on Vimeo On Demand? How does that work? So that one, I think that's, yeah. So, 
I believe that's just the 80 20 split with Film mm-hmm. Hub. So I think on okay. Vimeo on Demand, they're either 99 cents or 199. So I think we would get you know, either 50 cents or a dollar from that. But I, you know, we 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 did promote most of the Amazon just because we assumed more people had that. And yeah, uh, we were hoping the algorithm, if, if you know, it gets a lot of streams, and Amazon may say, Hey, rec- recommended for you. And oh yeah, I have a lot of students in the states, so they'll like, you guys should all watch this as an example of how it can be done. Like it can be done <laughs> yeah, yeah, for yeah. that alone. But it, you'll probably like the film too. It's it's really good. Um, so your actor who plays Frank, like he was good, but he was fantastic in that one scene where you really needed him to be. Where no spoiler alert, but I, I won't I won't give you a spoiler. But it's a it's a big important scene. So. Uh, so you said you mostly just listen. I mean, how did logistically like you pulled you pulled that out of him like an ex- and I know that's a lot of him too, like an expert director. But um, how logistically did you do it when you were the actor on set? You were the director and you were the producer. I you know so I think he's comfortable. I, I shared the story on uh, you know I set up a little Instagram page uh, mm-hmm. at Let Me Be Frank Film where I'm just kind of introducing everybody to the cast and crew and giving a little bit more backstory of how we did it. And so I, he was one of the first posts there. And, you know, I talked about that scene because initially that was going to be the first scene of the first day of production. Uh, and he was like, no, that's not, you know, we can't do it. And so I had to talk to, you know, the, the people who are all helping us get a schedule now, which was most of the film students they had experience building out whole schedules. So let's move this maybe to the second day. Just let us get our feet wet. Cause that, that might be the movie right there. Like, if this scene works, then we have a movie. That's how I kept looking at it. And so the day came to shoot and, uh, you know, we were shooting in his apartment. We ha- we have photos of his mom in his apartment who has, you know, uh, has passed away. And it's all very, um, it's just all very real. Um, they were based, you know, me writing that script was based on conversations I had with him, just, you know, person to person knowing you know, some of the the, the, the issues and, and regrets or tribulations he might have been through. And so as everyone's setting up lights or whatever, my job of directing was not in scene. It was being with him in the bathroom, you know, while he's crying is that I don't know if I can do this. You know, I don't know if I can do this. Just I, I don't want to go there emotionally, you know, makes me uh, like it's, it's, it's really heavy. And so we just started talking about how you know, he, he just, the way he would be able to power through is, is knowing that his mother would want him, you know, to, to do this scene and that, you know, she, she'd be looking down on him proud. And so that, the most emotion was before the scene set and then getting him to the point where he was ready to do it. And it wasn't so much me. I didn't do anything except be in the bathroom with him as he kind of worked through his feelings and, 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 and hugging him and, and that sort of emotional support. And then when we said action, you know, it, it was it was all him. It was his close up and, and he was speaking from the heart. And I don't know if he had any tears left because that morning it was uh, it was it was definitely flowing. Uh, so so we still caught it on camera and I felt I felt good to be there for him. But then, you know, when I said cut. I I jumped up and down, you know, it was it's weird because you like, knew. <laughs> Yeah, you know that he's sad and so you know and it's emotional but then you're so excited by his performance and so excited that oh my gosh we might have a movie and and so early and so you know it quickly shifted from this sort of uh you know kind of uh in the doldrums sort of heaviness to really excited him and me and the rest of the crew of like oh wow we just captured something i think really human that a lot of people can relate to whether it's losing a loved one or, uh, you know, just uh, thinking about, you know, what if, you know, did I do the right thing when I made this life decision? So can I just tell you that as someone who's worked very closely with over 200 directors, how many directors don't know to do that? Don't know to be with the actors, especially before those scenes and in between those scenes. The, I saw an interview with the director who did Room and he said, my only job as the director is to be present for the actors and, and the crew. And that is correct. And that is, and I mean, you know, there's not, there's more than one way to make a movie, but that 
you just did that instinctively. So I want you to understand how uh, gifted you are as a director, just by being a gifted human being, a sensitive and emotional, and you you see people. So um, uh, so thank you for that. You don't even know that you have this gift. Now you probably know, but you just you know now you told me now it's gonna go to my head. No no well, I, no I, no. <laughs> I am serious. Look at look at my credits. I've worked with huge directors. Uh, I mean, some of them do that, but it's so rare and it's so important. You know, that's, I, I think it's worth mentioning. I th in the moment, I just, he needed a friend. I think mm -hmm. if I would have been in the director's mind, I would have been like, what do you mean you can't do this? You know, we have the whole crew here. We need this. This is the move. But I was just like, you know, as a, and it, it helped, you know, by by the fact that we knew each other before and I wrote the screenplay for him, hit the character for him. And so I know that's not always the case. And I, you know, I would love to think that if it wasn't my friend, I still would have realize mm. that to be there for them but in this case it was, it was yeah, instinctual because i've it, i've seen them cry before you know i know oh wow yeah. that is a that is a great way to learn that you know on your first movie to have your actual friends and your actual girlfriend and realize what the tone and the vibe on set mm. needs to be that's that's beautiful ryan that's so beautiful i'm like getting teary thinking oh. <laughs> <laughs> um so so you must have learned so much from, so do you have any takeaways? Like what would you do differently next time? What were the biggest things you learned? Um, I, I think, I think that, that, um, I don't know. I don't know if I could do it again. This one just seems so unique in, in the way that it happened to where, like I said, we had, we had the cast in the same, basically the same apartment building the neighbor was down the street but you know and then we lucked into these film students being available and making that relationship and so it my advice is would be if if you want to make a film the key is going to be just being as resourceful as possible and don't worry about you know if it's if if your script is going to suffer because the people behind the camera may be amateurs, if it's yourself doing it, because a lot of the times you're probably making those sacrifices, even if Amazon Prime like produced it from the jump, you know, someone's going to have a whole other idea and, and they might, you know, quote unquote, ruin the screenplay. So I, I would just encourage people to like you if you write a story, especially screenwriters, you know, and you you put your heart into it and it means something to you don't let it collect dust on the side. If it's, and that's after a few months, I was like, eh, I put way too much time into that for nothing to come of it. You know, it's okay to make a bad movie. That's, that's where I'd be, that, that was the, the launch I took. I was on Netflix and watching bad movies. Like, why can't I make a bad movie? I should be allowed <laughs> to make a bad movie. And so just kind of taking the expectation and the weight away from that and just being like, you know what? I want to tell this story. That's why I wrote it in the first place. And I'm not going to be too hard on myself if I make a bad movie because people make millions in careers, you know, getting away with that. So. Oh, yes. I've worked on some bad movies yeah, for a lot yeah. of money. Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, the way I have a saying with my entrepreneurs, done is better than perfect. And yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, your movie is not perfect, but it's great. It's <laughs> you know, done. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> and it's done, but be, it's beyond done. It's great. Like there's, there's, I, I think it's more elevated than just done. Like you have a good portfolio now and so does your girlfriend and so does Frank. And so, you know, so does your editor. Like, it's great. Even all those film students, they, they have a feature film credit. <laughs> I hope so. And that was, you know, even when it got tough, that became the reason to get it done is because, you know, all these, it, if somebody signed up, because they wanted credit, well, you, you gotta have to finish the movie, or else you know you you, you kind of uh, you didn't hold up your end of the bargain. So, uh, wow. And did did it? I mean, I know you were saying you shot weekends here, or there. What? How long was that process of shooting? Um. So I, I believe it started summer 2019, and we did, you know, a good. We were we were pretty solid for about a month because it was just interiors, and we had you know Frank's apartment, my apartment, the outside of the neighborhood. And then it started getting uh, a little more difficult when it's like, okay, how are we going to do this restaurant scene? How are we going to do this barbershop scene? And those were available. Church scene, you know, those, those are available. hard locations to get. Yeah. Yeah. And when I, and even actually the final scene and the one we ended up doing the most, I thought writing car scenes would be easy because I, I have a car, let's just film it. And those, I, I would probably stay away from writing those in the future because they ended up being a, uh, 
you know, really difficult. And at the end, we were able to get this uh, sort of uh, mechanism that our camera was light. So we were able to just mount inside the car for that opening shot. And, uh, you know, we, but that was, that might've been a year after original production. And mm -hmm. it was definitely after the rough cut. Um, so. Oh, wow. Oh, I mean, that's kind of cool that you could keep shooting as you're cutting. That's really cool. Um, yeah. that, that's a really good thing about low budget. Um, yeah, car scenes. There's a reason we use car rigs and even car rigs, a million things can go wrong. They're, they're really expensive actually to film if you do it the way that we do it in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. And it, we, we, we were considering it, but we didn't have insurance. We didn't have permits. Yeah. And so driving yeah. around LA and, you know, this <laughs> camera on the side, we, we just weren't confident that we would uh, get away with it. Oh, did no one ever stop you and said, do you have a permit? No, no. And we, we, we tried to be, you know, discreet. Um, but at, at, there were times where we, we did a monopod on some of the outdoor scenes. I don't know if that's still a rule where they say, you know, if, as long as it doesn't have three legs, you can set yeah. it down, down. But we were just going to say, oh, we thought that was a rule. And we were really prepared to say we, we're, you know, trying a camera out we're film students because yeah. they were film students and uh you know we're yeah but luckily it never came to that incredible i mean i i think the universe was on your side with this one <laughs> yeah I, I wouldn't i wouldn't try to do it again but everyone listening should try and do it for sure now, now i know the full um you know, the full breadth of like what you're going to achieve because of this film, it's probably going to become apparent to you 10 or 20 years later. Like it, it, you're going to look back and go, oh, that led to that led to that. Um, you know, when you're big and famous, which you, you could, you very well could be. Um, so has your life changed at all so far? Um, not due directly to the, the, this film and I'm, I'm still in the process of it. I, I'm, uh, you know, of, of trying to get it out there and share it with people. But I am, I am hopeful that, you know, my goal would be, be great to get a literary manager. I've yet to like email anyone and say, Hey, you know, I have a movie on Amazon prime. You can check it out, but that's on my to-do list. And then there's a couple other programs. I think Sundance calls it like Sundance next or something, but specifically for sophomore films. And I'd mm -hmm. like to finish my next screenplay and submit it to there. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, so ironically, the music element that I came to L.A. to do, that started working out um, <laughs> in the midst of all this. And so that's where my focus has been now, trying to get, um, you know, I, I, I'm going to be so South by Southwest, depending on what you're into. You know, it's a film festival. It's a music festival. And a, I think a tech festival is what they call it. Oh. All three different weeks. And I submitted, let me be frank, to the film festival, obviously, and it didn't get in. But I just uh, got accepted for the music festival. And so I was joking about that. that like, <laughs> last time I talked to you, you know, you weren't, you know, into it. So, yeah, it's things are heading in a good direction. And my hope is that with the music growing, people will go back and find my uh, film on Amazon and I'll be able to just tell a variety of stories whether they rhyme you know or they don't um, oh man i really liked and uh, you wrote the songs you wrote the, the lyrics right of the songs in the movie those those were great too <laughs> thank, thank you thank you yeah there's one song with lyrics and the rest you know i, I tried to do the score thing you know I, I really like uh like some of trent reznor and uh, atticus ross that did the kind of electronic scores i that was more that was tougher than i realized it would be and i think maybe that the film could use more music, but uh, I, I don't know. I don't like, it always seems like a real TV thing to do, like use music to bring out the emotion of the scene, like yeah. the Frank scene. I didn't want to use music. And we, we went back and forth a bunch of times, like whether we should do it, but I almost sometimes make it, makes it seem like corny or cheesy. But I know if I go see like Dune this weekend, it's going to have a <laughs> lot of music and it's going to be cool. So I, I, I don't know how. Back but you, you know, you said Richard Linklater, he doesn't, I mean, he has not a lot of, he has the soundtracks, but not, not music, not like Yeah, that. not a lot. I was, I was watching the Before Trilogy religiously to see like, no, there's all the music in those came live. So maybe they walked through us a, a uh, you know, a little uh, festival and you hear music or they had a coffee shop and there's music in the background, but there was never any, what you would call score. And I, I did use that as a framework. 
you 100% will get a literary agent, like no problem. You've had a produced feature. It's okay. well done. It's well written. Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, you, it, it, uh, you're going to get a literary agent. You just got to get out there and do it. And you're the person who does it. So you'll be fine. <laughs> you'll be fine. My, my advice to you is just really interview them. Make sure you get the right well, one. I, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And not that there's only one, there's going to be many that you like, but make sure you like them and that they're on, you know, they, they have the vision that you have for your career. It's, uh, it's going to be a good one. Okay, we've got, oh, we've good. We've got some time for questions. Let's see if people have been writing them in the chat and I'll relay them to you. Julia Beanie is here. She also distributed her feature film on, she had a 20, 21,000 Canadian budget on hers and she distributed what, it on Amazon. The transfer there? Is it a little? Oh, uh, it's probably about 15 grand US. Okay. <laughs> Luxury. <laughs> no, no, no. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, she said, yeah, Film Hub. Oh, so maybe Julia did it that mm -hmm. way. Julia, yes, Tubi. It took me a year for mine to get accepted to Tubi. Give it time, she says. Amazing. Amazing. Oh, so Beverly says, how can we see the movie? Need a link. I will post the link for sure after, um, but it's on, you can just search, let me be frank on uh, Vimeo on demand for Canadians and the Americans can go to amazon.com, right? And Amazon prime. Yeah. 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 Um, it, there's a few, let me be Franks, but I think it's popping up near the top. Now we luckily we've got some Amazon reviews. There's a few, let me be Franks. Oh, wow. Or, or there's, there's like a, may I be Frank? Yeah, again, you know, a little tongue in cheek title, you know, maybe could have been better, but <laughs> I told you I was okay with making a bad movie. So I just kept everything. <laughs> That's great. It's kind of great. It's so many directors like I'm going to make the greatest movie and it's like so yeah. bad. <laughs> you got the opposite. Julia says 14,500 US. Any question? That was how much her film cost. Any questions for Ryan? I, I, you guys have to watch his film and all the people that are here. I know you guys. Hi, Andrea. Oh, Andrea in Atlanta. Um, oh. uh, I sh if you just tuned in, Andrea, you've got to go back and watch this on replay. You are going to love Ryan. <laughs> um, yes. Does anyone have questions uh, for Ryan? And I, I probably have more, but though you you talked about everything I wanted to talk about for sure. Yeah, no, you were, you, you hit them all. I just, yeah, the main thing I wanted to get across the re and the reason I posted initially was that, you know, there's not a success story. Like I said, I haven't made a dime from it yet. I haven't even got another crib, but I know how many of us just like want to make something. And I did feel like there was something here that, you know, I know when I was, writing the screenplay and looking for stories like Robert Rodriguez's and trying to find some encouragement to like, no, I'll just make it. You know, it was always, it was always super, super helpful and encouraging when I found something. So I, I was, I wanted to share that, Hey, it, it, hit gonna, film up. You, you can get on Amazon if that's the goal, but you got to make it too. And that's yeah. also possible. Uh, if, if you, you know, we were lucky also that we could, we had a camera that we could borrow because our the editor's friend owned one. So that to get that camera, I'm sure that would have upped the budget. But that camera is relatively affordable that we use the Black Magic Pocket Cinema one. So that, you know, I think if you bought that and the um, sound equipment we use, you're still under 10. Um, wow. And then you just need and then you can use that on all the movies. Um, oh, we got a question from Julia. What is your promotion strategy now that it's on Amazon? So it, I don't know if it's worked so far, but um, the, the, the most useful thing was actually we did, I, I posted in a few Reddit groups. I think it was Reddit, the subreddit screenwriters, even cinematography, filmmakers. And those, the community of filmmakers were more interested, I think, in the movie than anybody because they, everyone wants to make movies. They want to know how you made it. And, you know, they were super supportive. And so there were specifically in screenwriters that, that one uh, went viral. And it's one, it was one of the most liked posts there. And so, and there were a lot of people saying, I checked it out, you know, so I think a lot of our viewers came from posting on Reddit groups or found Facebook groups as well. I think that's where you saw me post. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, I, I started an Instagram page where we, we, we share stuff there. And um, I reached out to critics directly. I made a list of, you know, people who will review films, whether it's for a big, you know, newspaper like LA Times or just 
you know, Chad reviews movies. I found a couple YouTube movie reviewers and reached out to them directly. And um, even trailer, we got a trailer reaction because I found a trailer reaction people. And so these new ways of... of uh, in, oh, in, did you reach out to Ava DuVernay? Uh, no, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I haven't think thought to reach out to producers, uh, yet, but maybe I should, I don't know. Do you know the story of Black Bodies, which was like a short that some Canadians made and, um, they weren't getting any traction in Canada and they got into Sundance and they weren't getting any media attention in Canada at all. So, um, they tweeted out to Ava and Ava retweeted and she was like, you know, pay oh, attention wow. to the yeah and then their film blew up and their careers blew up it is uh i think it's important to go there you have really something that i think she would love to see she's remember she started out as a first yeah. as a publicist but then as a distributor so i know yeah no she was you know rejected from sundance i think this is a i just always see this uh this this statistic it's like six times or something before they accepted the film so i always find those things encouraging um, but yeah, and then you know, just reached out to all, all my contacts as well and tried to share with everybody I know. But yeah, uh, Jim Cummings is a, is a director, filmmaker from Austin that I know one South by Southwest and just put out a movie beta test. But uh, he, he has a, I think it's a case study. It's either on Sundance.com or can dot com but about his promotional strategy because once okay. he won south by um a lot of people were offering to buy his films but he didn't think the deals were that good and so mm -hmm. he just self-distributed and he talks about how he did that how he made his money back and so i kind of used that as a blueprint as well uh oh great. Jim cummings and i can't remember sorry if it's on can or or, or sundance.com but i do think self-distributing and self-promoting can be useful and hopefully it works you know for us that's the huge entrepreneurial part of this it's so exciting to see uh self-distribution like actually reaching people right um yeah. oh julia says oh thanks never thought of reaching out to critics embarrassingly enough <laughs> yeah. Yeah. she does a really special sort of comedy sci-fi kind of genre and like um like it's it's very specific her style so it would be very interesting to reach out to certain critics uh julia yes see your yeah, i'll be honest i haven't heard uh you know i, I haven't seen any reviews pop up obviously it's a little nerve-wracking because you know <laughs> they might not like it but i was i was just thinking who likes to watch movies who's most passionate about movies maybe even in you know, a low budget indie films and you know, critics, even if they may be mean or verbose, whatever it may be, I think maybe naively, I assume that they still are passionate about watching movies. So I thought there'd be a chance that they would they would check it out. And we'll see. You know, I, I think I emailed them a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but. Oh, so uplifting. I love your story. I love your vibe. I loved your movie. I, I think your girlfriend is also headed big places, I think. <laughs> Has she already gotten offers from the movie? She so she was able to get into uh, you know she, while we were so we were everyone was not SAG to begin with uh, by the end you know they in the production they ended up being SAG and we had to figure out you know what was happening because she was able to this CBS show called Bull uh, that it's just it's kind of like a Law and Order you know procedural and she booked that in production of here and so we we've yet to see like whether or not her manager can use this to get her you know, other opportunities, but she's had a few auditions. I'd like to think hopefully, you know, we're from um, casting directors who maybe saw the movie because I was, I was working as a talent manager. Um, what? When I, when I wrote the screenplay, the next thing I did was I read this book. It was like, what to do after you write your screenplay. <laughs> and the, the ideas were basically find, you know, wealthy people in the industry who can, make your film or else it's just going to sit there I'm like okay so i applied to all the internships i could find and i ended up at a talent management company which you know i didn't really know isn't going to help me with my script at all but i was able to uh kind of see breakdowns come in and and, and work with actors see how they are and get up this you know database of casting directors and so when i finished the film you know, i emailed the film of 700 casting directors who knew me because I had, you know, emailed them and worked with them, pitched my actors to them. So I was hoping that 
you know, some of them might give Frank a try or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, my Wow. <laughs> Wow. Well, I'm I'm excited to to see your trajectory, Ryan. Like it's it's it's, it's actually really inspiring and exciting. Uh, Julia says you never know. Best of luck. Um, okay, so there's no more questions. I just want to say thank you for your time and thank you for your story and thank you for your movie. And um, I'm really gonna be looking out for you. I'm going to email you because I have another offer to make you, but <laughs> I, I just hard. think uh, the more keep getting out there, the more people see meet you because listen, um, if you did want to direct them and if you did want to act, um, I mean, even as it's certainly as a writer, half the battle is people being able to work with you and you clearly have this presence, this sort of stability and this like trustworthiness just as naturally your natural vibe that um you will have no problem um getting work but uh but consider directing i hope it's not your last time directing um at all um actually because you have things to say and you have things to say on the page but i think you have things to say through the human like you know by directing actors which is uh something that everyone should aspire to who's directing but many directors don't have that skill yet and you just have it naturally so and yeah well, that's it there's a you know so nice of you to you know, you know share your if one to watch the film and be interested in the story but you know say all these really um you know really kind things and i know that yeah they come from a genuine place but it's exciting you know i i like i said the reason i reached out to all the, the critics or filmmakers i know there's like still people who really enjoy storytelling at you know maybe a low just human level and you know we didn't have explosions or anybody flying or anything and you know no I, guns. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like, maybe that's the sequel and frank takes us back to the bronx no know. guns please i'm like i never i never write guns in my movies no, i witnessed no. a gun accident on set pretty early in my career so as you know on, oh, on yeah i never write guns I, it's why i'm so um happy to read scripts like yours thank you so much i'm just thrilled to give the story to julie you know, and any other, any other Mondo watches, anybody, if anyone goes and, you know, makes a movie after this, then that's all. I think you've inspired, I mean, I haven't heard from Beverly yet, but I think you've inspired her now. <laughs> she's in my screenwriting, she's an incredible actress and she's in my screenwriting class. So I think she, oh, do she it, knows. Beverly. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Okay.